Hello, everyone. I'm Dara Bunjan, the food enthusiast, PR maven, food stylist, author, and again, the frustrated baker. God, I hate baking. Uh, today's show, we're talking with uh, Nancy Longo, Chef Nancy Longo of Pierpoint Restaurant, and she's just off of being live on Press Box, talking about her time down at the NFL, Taste of the NFL, every Super Bowl representing the Ravens. Nancy, thank you for coming. We're already keyed up. Um, tell us a little bit more about the Taste of the NFL and how you got involved with it and how you represent the Ravens and the good times. So, well, thanks for having me, Dara, and, and giving me also a little time to talk about what I do and what's near and dear to me but this, with Taste of the NFL. So Taste of the NFL is an event that is um, an NFL-sanctioned event every year the night before the Super Bowl where 32 chefs and football players, as well as a few other chefs and football players, come together to raise money for the food banks all over the United States. So we raise money, and the money goes and gets dispersed. But in the meantime, we all have our little competitive year-long Tick Hunger Challenge where we raise money for our hometown food bank. That's still going on right yes, now. Yes, it is. We, so, we, so, so you Ravens fan, go to kickhungerchallenge.com and pick up the Ravens and then kick in some money. Let's whoop some ass. Yeah, well, the, the best of that is the money, it, 100% of it goes back to our, our food bank. And the beauty of this is I feel like if folks really, really want to uh, say something kind about their team and how amazing year we had, go on there and donate a couple bucks. It, it, it is utterly, utterly amazing what we do um, with chefs. And, you know, we all pay for our own food. We, we go there and we're feeding... 3,000 people and you're making crab cakes. It's not a cheap ordeal. And that's how I got the gig. They came to Baltimore. They asked a bunch of restaurant owners, not just looking for me particularly, and said, where do I get a really, really good crab cake to go to this event? And they said, go ask Nancy. And so I was given the gig by my peers, which is really actually pretty cool. That is cool. And you carry, I'm, I think you get some produce that's donated, but you yeah. cover the cost of crab meat for how many crab cakes? It's, it's, it's like 3,000 people come through this thing. But you're the first one that clears well, out I, food. I, I la yeah, yeah, because, <laughs> well, there's another interesting little piece of this. We always make jokes and we go, how well your team does is also where your location is. I spent some time in the back by the bathrooms. I've spent a lot of time by the front door, mid mid range. But one of the things is because um, we go and we make a real crab cake. And, and the thing is, is they said, you know, people really like your food. We, we've seen them get back in line two or three times. So we need to make sure that you have a good spot. We don't ever want you to not have enough food. We, we did run out of crab cakes in Indianapolis um, a few years ago. I think they were thinking that we hated them, so they didn't get any more crab cakes. It was <laughs> it was quite funny, but no, it's good. We we generally are, have sold out of all our food every year. And don't you usually have um, a football player at your booth? So yeah, we've had a plethora of players, that, but the the most current, and long standing has been Kadri Ishmael, and Kadri and I have a really good time. We we talk to each other over the course of the year and stuff, but. Good stuff. We, we, we've had some shenanigans in the last couple of years. I've really gotten much closer with him. Uh, two years ago, they had, a, they had a wonderful cake, and this cake had all the teams on it. And Cadre says, well, what is this stuff? And I said, well, that, that's um, pastillage. Um, and he says, well, the Ravens are on the back of the cake. They, that's, they're dissing us. I said, I can fix that. So we decided that we needed to move them, and he decided that we needed to figure out which team needed to get moved. We decided that the, uh, God, I'm going to get killed for this. The Dallas Cowboys were no longer America's team, so we put us in a Dallas Cowboys spot. Then someone saw me, and they moved, made me move the Green Bay Packers. Meanless to say, this beautiful cake that someone made was there. I, I, don't, think the, I don't even think the Cleveland Browns were on the cake. I think that was really sad. Here comes 30 football players in their gold jackets from their meeting, and they manhandled this cake with their bare hands. <laughs> it was the most hysterical thing. But as a chef, in your beautiful work, you're like, oh, dear God, <laughs> they just ruined my cake. It was great fun. So let's talk about Super Bowl. We're going to go with themes of food mm -hmm. for the city. So we have Kansas City, which would be easy, which is right. smoked brisket. 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 Yep. Okay, 
San Francisco. San Francisco. There's like so many things that you could eat. I mean, the problem is, is that California food in general is a, a microcosm of modernization of all of the bar cuisines we have from all the things, you know. So we don't want to just say like San Francisco, the race of Roni treat, because there's so many things to do. But what what are the things that you do know most notably is, is some of the most wonderful um, Asian restaurants in the United States are all in San Francisco. So, I mean, I would say to someone, go with that theme. Go go with um, you know again a, a beef rib that you could you could glaze into an Asian uh, item or a, or a, a duck or something like that. You could you could make yourself your own um, duck Asian style barbecue and serve it on a wonton wrap or some other kind of fun things to do. Um, with me, I, I I I try to do like enormous amount of research, but you know um, f- football food has has drastically changed you know we always used to think everything was just hot dogs and hamburgers and if you spend any time in any of the stadiums now they have all these elaborate food stations and places so um you the sky's the limit with that but i i would stick with that and also because we are also coming up on chinese new year so we want to think about that part of it too at the same time right. we did we did one year get caught up in the middle of chinese new year in san diego it was wild during the super bowl all the chefs wanted to do that you know, I'm going to switch back to um, the Super Bowl, but let's go with Chinese New Year's. Yeah. You know Chinese food like the back of your hand. So us Baltimoreans might not know it. Nancy started off when she was in diapers working at the Pimlico Hotel <laughs> yes, in the kitchen with um, Mr. Benny Durr. Yeah, well, so with the ha- Chinese chef that the Pimlico yes. had. So I was this really young girl and... Uh, I think he liked me. I think he wanted to hook me up with his son or something. But he says to me, if you teach me, if you make me an omelet, I'm going to teach you how to make Peking duck. So I, I stayed there and I learned how to make wonderful dumplings and Peking duck and all kinds of other um, Asian specialties. So it's, it, is, it is something near and dear to my heart. Um, but I would say, you know, you, you come up with your, your uh, thought about it and you make that. So maybe we're going to make some egg rolls and call them foot rolls because it's like a football and those egg rolls at the Pimlico were the size of a football if you remember well they were quite famous in fact who was it the um, elephant the last iteration of the elephant they had the egg roll from the Pimlico I believe yes they had that on the menu but you know the Pimlico and Chinese food that was that was something really wild it was synonymous it just you you went there and if you took your crowd to eat dinner and somebody sitting on the other side just wanted a steak and mashed potatoes, it was okay because they had this most glorious Asian menu and Chinese food. You could you could all get whatever it was that you wanted there, and it was going to be damn good no matter what. And um, but but it was just it was a great experience. Um, I learned a lot about uh, cooking, so many different things, preferably like fried rice. People always think fried rice. Hmm. What about fried rice? Well, fried rice is one of those things people think about. I like it, but I can't eat much of it because it's full of full of fat. And the fact of the matter is, the way I was taught, it wasn't. It wasn't swimming in sesame oil. You can do it. There's a couple little tricks uh, to making it better. We have a question from last week's guest, Marcy Yankalov from Baltimore Supper Club. They are doing a Japanese-inspired party next month. It's already booked out, everybody, but she's wondering if you might have some thoughts on dishes, simple dishes people can make that are going to be Japanese-oriented. You were more Chinese. So. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I, I used to teach at the Baltimore Culinary School. So uh, one of the things that I had to do when I was there was to teach a 12-week class in world cuisine. So what I did was, which was really kind of smart when I got there, I met a whole bunch of young students that I'd find out where they were from. And... and one of my best friends, Marty Cosgrove, I learned about New Orleans food. He introduced me to Paul Prudham. Then I had another kid that was Japanese, so I actually learned a lot about Japanese food from him. So, I mean, one of the things that you mostly think about um, Japanese is like shumai, or um, y- you think about uh, y- yakitori and stuff. So, like, uh, the, the glaze that you sit when you go to the Japanese place and you get um, eel, so there's a specific mix of things that you put in there, and it's a little, little bit of a sherry and sugar. It's not quite the same as a traditional just soy 
because um, you need like miso and these other things to add to it. I, 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 I am a little pressed for giving you a recipe off the top of my head right now, but I'm happy to, if you get in touch with me to help you uh, with that. But, but Japanese food obviously is very different. It's very light. Um, it's rice in a different way because you use cow rose to make sushi versus using jasmine or regular rice for, for Asian dishes. And the other one is is that uh, fried rice, people always think of fried rice. Oh, I get this rice and I'll just use this. But the problem is you got to use the right rice and you got to cook it the day before because if you don't, the kernel is uh, still warm and it makes the rice get gl- glowy and gobby instead of... becomes a risotto. Yes. Exactly, it, it and, and you don't have to use the cow rose or arborio. It just becomes that because it just keeps wanting to absorb everything you you give to it. Um, but you know, we also like a lot of soybean dishes and miso involved in um, Japanese food. But it's you know, it's always much lighter. You see some noodle dishes, udon, buckwheat noodles. Those kinds of things are always fun. Sometimes I've made some fun little like um, meatballs uh, with chicken and stuff and and crispy. Uh, soba noodles on the outside of them just for fun so the modernization of asian food crossing it into an american style thing is, is good uh, cross-cultural fun um but you have to remember that you stay true to these original ingredients so i always tell people you know they come for we have cooking classes and we say to them you know this is a piece of paper for the future of your creativity have some fun with it but don't walk away from whatever the base of that cuisine is and then you'll stay true to whatever it is that you're trying to make while being creative. You know, you brought up the cooking classes. I've come to a couple of yours. In fact, that's how we met. <laughs> yeah, Daryl started me with the cooking the classes, classes 30 right? years I think, ago. I think I started a lot of people with yes, the you did. Club. Yes. But Nancy has the best cooking classes. Number one, you get to take the food home when you're done. There's always leftovers. And because she's a restaurant, she can serve you alcohol at the same time. <laughs> so the class becomes quite fun. And we do over 11 recipes on average at each one. If I, if I tackle a, a cuisine, I want you to learn the basis of what the, it, people most know about that cuisine. So it's a kind of important to me. And, and that is actually how we started when we, we did them with you because I wanted to do that. And I'm naturally a teacher. I, I do like to do them. Um, it's fun. It's, it's a good time. You also do cooking classes in the summer and over the holidays for children. We do. And then you also do, um, there went that, um, um, team building. Yes. So we have done quite a few team building for a bunch of the corporations downtown. We like to do them where we really give them uh, a sense of how to deal with a disastrous situation oftentimes we'll make teams change sides mid 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 uh event or we'll let them have baskets where they can get everyone picks a ticket out and might say steal food from somebody else it it, it can make it really stressful for people but i enjoy it the stuff that we do for the kids i've been doing for the last we're going into our 19th to 20th year I, i'm starting to tell them how old i'm getting but it's okay So we wanted to teach kids how to cook because I had some parents that asked me, and it blossomed into this thing um, that we've done for years. Um, And we do almost nine, ten weeks with these kids. Um, It is an all-day thing. The kids are there. They take food home. They do have a lecture. We do teach them respect of um, restaurant equipment so that they can go home. And years ago, it was funny, somebody wrote something into Elizabeth Large's column about the restaurants are doing cooking classes and somebody said hey elizabeth i sent my kid to one of nancy longo's classes and now my kid gets up in the morning and makes food enough to where i'm burning my house down trust me it's a good thing <laughs> so it was really kind of cute but th- we have a lot of kids we have had a bunch of kids that have ended up on uh, food network we've we've mentored a few there are a bunch of them that went to carver after that i've had someone went on to johnson and wales so i i feel like it's a good thing that I, i'm offering that for the kids th- there's a half a dozen of us that do them um in the city ours are you know obviously a little bit different because we are there with them all day and we really they truly get, they get a little chef's coat. oh they have chef jacket um you know they are they and we reward them so if the kids come and they're really really good and interested and we say to them okay so if we move along through this list of things that we're going to learn today and we still have time you can make a wish list and they come up with wish ideas for things that they want to make 
Um, and then there's always, you know, the kid who gets the wooden spoon for the day because they're the chef of the day. But I, I've, I had so, I've had some really awesome kids in the last year who, who really, truly loved cooking, and, and we made a bunch of things. And I, I let them challenge me. I let them say to me, hey, do you know how to make this? And I said, no. And they said, well, this is what we learned to make. And I said, okay, well, then we're going to do it, and I'm going to learn along with you. Because you never want to let anyone think you know more. Then you do. You gotta. You gotta tell the truth. Be be honest. And and if you stop learning in the food world, then you're dead. You're done. You can't. You can't do it anymore. Because well, I think that's in anything. We all have yeah. to be receptive to new ideas and incorporate them in our lives as well as we can. What's suitable to us. I want to get back just so people know that if they want to do something this Saturday for Chinese New Year's out at Chopsticks in Rosedale. They are doing a 10-course lunch in the Live Dragon and Firecrackers. And um, they can go to Chopsticks page or go to uh, ChefWooCan.com. And that's Chef Wu, W-O-O-N-C-A-N.com. And you can get a ticket there. And they actually have a discounted ticket you can get at that time. But that would be great fun if you want to get involved with Chinese I'm have to news. do that. All right, well, I'm having a dumpling, a dueling dumpling. We're going to have a dueling dumpling. With, with Cyrus. With Cyrus yes. and I are going to do dueling dumplings uh, in March. So this should be fun. Yeah, I, Since we both have this thing for Asian food and we both have a dumpling thing. So it should be fun. I mean, everybody will be able to see that shortly on the... Uh, PeerPoint Facebook page. So it, I'm looking forward to it because it, dumplings are my life. Well, you know, what can I say? Dumplings are my favorites as well. Uh, before I forget about it, I need to tell people about Nancy Longo. It isn't just what she's doing now. She uh, created a fundraiser back in, was it 92? Yeah. Um, Save the Bay and a proponent of saving the Chesapeake Bay had the leading chefs from all over the country come in and it was held at the aquarium. And from that led to going undercover for ABC Primetime Live. Tell us a little bit more about that. So I, in 1990, woke up one day with a golf ball growing out of my arm. And it was the, it was the most god-awful, scary thing I've ever did. So I went and had a surgery, and they said I had a former Schlegel, and I had to remove these lymph nodes, which meant that my body was now compromised for raw seafood. <laughs> Tell that to a girl who only likes to cook fish. At one point in time, I was at a restaurant called Something Fishy, and I tried 175 different kinds of fish in one year. Is that crazy? It was crazy. We were drying all these fish daily. You didn't do that fish that had the poison vein in it, did uh, I did have, yes. You yes. did? Yes. What, <laughs> do you remember what the name of that fish? Puffer fish. Puffer fish? You got to do puffer fish, and I've had snakeheads out of all these crazy things. Um, so what happened was after that occurred, I um, decided that I needed to raise money for the awareness of what we're doing with waterways. And I, I was already friends with Paul Prunham. And I asked Alice Waters to come blindly. And she said, if you, if you can't clean this up, then nobody can. All the other chefs came after they all decided to come. Out of that dinner, um, ABC got wind of it. And they asked me to go do an undercover thing with them because I was simultaneously going to go testify in front of Congress why we needed mandatory fish inspections. So I could go to Hanover Street Bridge, catch some fish, bring it back to my restaurant and sell it to you. That, that's a problem. It's a very serious problem, and it is to this day. So we really need to continue to work on this. But that being said, I went with ABC. We went all over the country. We were buying fish in places, and there was a camera rolling, and the whole thing went on, and... and uh, we found out it was that this stuff was like severely polluted. But the thing was, is what I also found out was that none of these fish markets were being held accountable for any form of storage or selling. So we went to Chicago and the guy's like, oh, yeah, we take the lobsters that are dead and put them in the freezer and sell them. I'm like, oh, my God. Or the mussels were floating and they were dead. And we're like, but people don't know and they buy them. And so I, I, I realized that we are in a very spoiled location here in Baltimore or in this state and East Coast being around really, really good seafood. I will say that when we tested the stuff through the Betty Crocker Clinic, they, they actually have testing sites through there, uh, the stuff from Maryland was not that bad. But it's a really important thing. And I think as a chef, staying involved in those kinds of things 
um, and and being a part of it is really important that we need to continue to talk about food safety because it's it's a dangerous dangerous slope if we allow these things to erode and and allow the stuff to be relaxed um so i that's that's my other thing my other i have my heart chopped up in little pieces but that one has a very large part of it because i really am uh, you know, I, I grew up with my dad being very sick. He had Crohn's and celiac, so I was very, very aware of food allergies and food issues that created problems for your health. So it, it, it's got to be another thing the chef wants to, to do and be involved in. Well, any tips for at home about seafood? Well, so first and foremost, I tell people if they want to buy fish, you got to go buy seafood. You want to go to a place where they you can see the fish whole before they cut it up. And what is, is the reason is that most importantly is that you can look at that fish, you can see if the thing's got clear eyes, if it's still got a little blood, if it's got a mucus, those kinds of things that would tell you that that thing is relatively fresh. So then you ask them to cut that up for you. You take your stuff home. Fish needs to breathe. So if you're going to take your fish home and you're going to not use it right away, put it in a container. Don't put a lid on it. Take some damp, wet paper towels and lay them on top of your fish to keep the skin from getting dry and the fish getting dry. Because fish will actually almost start to seem like it's tanning as it sits if it's, if it's not covered. And then you can use it, you know, right away. However, if the stuff smells like bleach, or which they did in this ABC thing, there were parts of it where they did it. I might, might have to have a viewing of that one day. And the video is great. Um, but you, you don't want to taste ble- bleach. You don't want it to smell like ammonia. And if those things are present and the fish is kind of discolored and you can see that the blood turns brown, I wouldn't be buying it. But me, I'm kind of crazy and, and I believe that I have to go to a good source to get it because of my issues. But the problem is now we have frozen the hell out of everything. And it's coming from all these foreign countries. I, it, the general consumer is hard-pressed to even find some shrimp in the grocery store that's from somewhere in the United States. It's, mm-hmm. it, it's all farm-raised. It's from other countries. And I, I just I don't feel healthy about it. I only buy golf shrimp. But, um, you know, we, we really have to look a little harder at our food sources. So that's my, that's my other thing. You know, we, as a chef, people think, oh... It's your job to go and be um, some narcissistic, oh, look at me, I can cook, and I'm wonderful, and I did this, and I did that, and I, uh, and yet I feel like you have to have a, a responsibility because you're nurturing someone with food. You're giving them food, and we, we even do that. Sometimes we, we have this nurture meals where someone can get a, a meal anonymously sent to someone because they need it. Uh, I, I, that's my thing. I, I'm, I'm not interested in just cooking food so that I can pound on my chest or boobs, as you say, <laughs> about what kind of stuff I just made. I really actually believe that it's much more than just cooking food, being a chef. There's a whole lot to being a chef, and it's the nature of wanting, it comes from that family table to want to, as you say, nurture, Yes. become part of a family, and be part of special occasions. Yeah, well, for for years, you know, we've done, I did some little videos for, I did stuff for our daily bread and, and I did stuff, again, at the Super Bowl. And my line to everyone is, it's my job as a chef to feed everyone. We did stuff for Meals on Wheels. My mom ended up having to have that in her latter part of her life. And I tell them the same thing. You never know when you're going to need this stuff. I, here I am a chef. I'm trying to make meals for my mother. I, my mother could not even get up to feed herself by putting something in the oven that I made for her that was wonderful. So we really have to we have to think about food sometimes more than just cooking food and having fun with it. I, I, I'm all over that, and um, I think it's I think it's really important to to take the whole circle and look at everything that you're doing with food as a chef. Right. Before I forget, we still have a little bit more to come. Sure. People, Pierpoint Restaurant, Nancy's Restaurant, been there since 1989. Woohoo! Yes. Um, website, pierpointrestaurant.com, 1822 Alisana Street in Baltimore. And actually, if you call ahead, she'll direct you. There are four parking spots a half block away that you can get and not have to worry about parking on the street and a short walk to the restaurant. 
And also, the Taste of the NFL, I think there's still tickets available for that that's being held at the Diplomat Beach Resort. Yes. Uh, February 1st, so they would find that on the Taste of NFL dot yes. com. And you, if you're going to be down in Miami at that time, get yourself a ticket. It's Good Eats. And come up and see Nancy because she'll have a good time uh, razzing you. you know. Well, and, and I didn't tell you, so this is another little food history thing. So this year, again, I, it, it is not an option. It must be a crab cake and it must have something with it. Um, but we are doing this wonderful little sherried uh, warm Brussels sprout slaw. Now, Brussels sprout slaw been on our menu for years, but you know, most people don't know something about that. So in the, la- the latter part of the 18th century, last 20 years of the 18th century, Maryland was the largest Brussels sprout growing state in the United States. So all get you people out. that love Brussels sprouts now, you, get out. you can be happy that it was something part of your hometown. Yeah, I actually did a um, menu once for the uh, bicentennial of the naming of Federal Hill. And uh, they sent me to the, see this woman who was the archivist of the Maryland menus and uh, recipes at um, the Maryland Historical Society. And I found all these menus, and I started looking at all this stuff. So when Pierpoint first opened, I did what I call Maryland Terranian food because um, I, I like my family, Italian heritage. And it was funny, Barbara Mikulski walked in one day. She used to live around the corner. And she said, your dad's op- said you're opening an Italian restaurant. I said, no, it's not happening, Barbara, but, but you'll be happy. <laughs> so we had, you know, the thing going on with the crab cakes and but, but but it was so weird because I studied all these things and found out that they didn't eat chocolate. They considered that poison. Uh, sweet potatoes were the only potatoes they ate. White potatoes were considered poison. We had uh, lots of a huge amount of pecan groves in Annapolis. So the more I studied it and the more I became so also fascinated with southern food and Louisiana, which is another love of mine. But the interesting thing was... That depending upon where you were in the state, you could understand all the settlements very well. Everything on the eastern shore. Go the furthest way was British, and they were still speaking with a Cockney accent, and Smith Island was a bizarre place. Some of the Cajuns and some of the French all stayed in Annapolis. That's why you'll see recipes for things from Annapolis that are very French. And then everything on the side of the bridge was was German. The, The Greeks, the Italians, obviously, and the Irish didn't come till later. But those things were very well known in terms of understanding food. So it's kind of funny how we laugh about crab soup. We think, well, not everybody else that's she crab soup. It's just that. No, only in Maryland do we have to have two different kinds that we can fight over. Who likes the cream stuff and who, who likes the red stuff? Well, the red stuff becomes from a German thing. It always had to have either ham, bacon, cabbage, and onions, which is a base kind of like as the way the Cajuns have their trinity, you know, we had to have those things in that soup. And everything in Annapolis had to have, like, sherry dropped in it and was done with cream because it was French. French. Very interesting stuff that a lot of people just don't think about. But you kind of learn something about your culture by reading recipes and and food to understand how the the free state is also the crazy state in terms of food because it's so dynamically different and from one place to the next i remember something you told me and maybe goes back because you were friends with paul perdome mm-hmm. and your friend marty down in new orleans and you were going through some of his books and there was something about um i'm umming again old bay oh um, yeah yes as well and so illusions tell that story so the so paul and i got to discussing about black and redfish spice and old bay and he said to me can you find out what the origins of old bay goes because it's kind of this thing that you know and you consider synonymous with baltimore and maryland as well as people where we are live with either my black and spice or cajun spice and the cajun spice is always something well that came from the fact that in in louisiana we have creole so it was an island thing where they made up that spice mix of all those peppers and the onion and the herbs that went in there were all done from a derivation of actually almost a jerk spice, which is a lot hotter. And, and they just they just made it more palatable. Here, the interesting thing was, it was actually done by a German man who was on the Eastern Shore, um, who became fascinated with spice mixes, and he decided to create this old bay. And that's something that we find synonymous with our food. But the interesting thing is, is having 
spend some time now because actually some of the people that work for Magic Season are now working for McCormick. I know that for a fact because they're still friends of mine. Is the is that these things that, that people consider so iconic that you can't consider making those foods without them? I don't think the guy that made the Old Bay was thinking of Cajun food at the time, but that spice was already around. So who knows? Maybe if anybody knows out there, please let me know if you know the relatives or whatever. Maybe he came in contact with some people that were uh, Cajun settlers or something because they used to go back and forth from here on their way to Canada. Um, And he decided that some kind of spice that would be indigenous to here um, would be better with our seafood. I I actually once took some and put it on a sheet and used a magnifying glass to see what the parts per million, because I had a friend of mine that was uh, having serious issues with salt. So I was trying to make her some Old Bay without it. And I don't think most of the people realize, like, how much ground uh, bay leaves and mustard seed that's actually in there. They think most of it all comes from some kind of the cayenne and the salt and, and all those other things. But it's those other seasons. But there's so many other things in there. Um, so it, it's it's a very interesting thing. But I guess that when he made it, he must have made it because those things were readily and easily available here. Of course, we all know that Maryland and Baltimore were, were was a port, were a spice trade. Right. So we could get anything we wanted here. Ann Wilder would tell the story that it was like leftover spices they would be selling down the port and that he put it all together in a bin. She had met him. May she yeah. rest in peace from Van Spices. Oh, yeah. um, I think we're running a little long because I can always talk with you, Nancy. <laughs> you know, Thank you. We, we have. We do. And, and I have to address, uh, Zach Green says the lovely Nancy Longo. And... My friend Jeff has been sending in notes, and he has a question for you. If you were condemned to die, what would be your last meal? My well, your it, last it, meal, of course. It, it, it I don't have to. It's it's a simple thing. It would definitely be some hard crabs and French fries. I have a very bad French fry habit. <laughs> okay, well we thank. Keep you. it simple. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah, that's it. All right, folks. Um, just some hot restaurant news. Jose Andreas uh, is opening in Johns Hopkins University Levering Hall, January twenty seventh. The restaurant Butterfly and Tortas. Now it's going to be a fast, casual restaurant, sort of a take off on his Washington Mexican restaurant Oyamel. And that is, again, open to the public. Baltimore County Restaurant Week is still going on through February 1st. Next week, uh, it's all going to be about manners. Do you think you know the proper etiquette? Send in your questions to food at jmoreliving.com. The ladies from the School of Protocol will be here. Uh, Did you know that it's absolutely rude to have your plate removed if somebody is still eating at the table? A lot of people don't know that. Servers don't know that. But it is rude. We have a lot of things coming up about manners next week. If you have a moment, go to kickhungerchallenge.com and donate under the Raven's name to help the Maryland Food Bank. Nancy, thank you for being here. And you can find her at pierpointrestaurant.com. She's on Alisana Street in Fells Point. I'm Dara Bunjan. I'm the food enthusiast. Every Thursday at 1230, we'll be here live. You can find our program on the Facebook, J. Moore Living, and on jmoreliving.com's page and also a YouTube. Thank you for sharing your time and listening to us. May your plates remain full. Have a great week.